and 30 minutes are for the presentation and 15 minutes are for the Q&A and for the inter interaction. And it's with great pleasure that my good friend uh, Zaini is our first presenter. He will be an excellent person to really give the introduction because Zaini has been doing this for the last 20 plus years. And he was one of the first guys I met in Malaysia on the subject of energy efficiency in buildings. Yes, he's a very seasoned guy. He's not one of those people that have been going into this recently because it's a trendy subject. He has been always doing this. That's why he is a top-notch expert in Malaysia on the subject. He has been advising the government on this. He will talk this morning about the landscape of energy efficiency, about the policy incentives, sector investments, what's going on with the ESCO market, green bonds, the MESI 2.0, uh, the energy efficiency monitoring framework. This is his scope of subject. He is the founder and principal consultant at signee4ee.com and co-founder and partner at EE Central. We will not really read through the CVs in detail. You have them all in the brochure. So, uh, Zaini, over to you. I'm really looking forward to get a great update from you this morning. Okay, thank you very much, my good friend, my test, uh, Gabba, my green man. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, thank uh, Comfori for giving me the opportunity to share something. And then uh, actually I was contacted by my green brother first. And then I say yes, because it's very interesting topic. However, the topic is very huge, right? Yesterday it took me half a day for the energy managers participant training for me to explain about the whole NGFCC landscape in Malaysia, but I only bought about half an hour. But I try to make my best, do my best to share, you know, and then of course, you know, we can uh, always communicate, you know, during the QA also, even for the, after that. All right, let me share with you my slide. Uh, the host hasn't any, uh, allowed me to share yet. Can you allow me to share the, uh, the host? I cannot share yet. I cannot share my slide yet. Can you allow me to share? Enable my sharing. Sikit, sikit, lama, lama, jadi bukit. Let's get it done, okay. guys. And, I haven't, uh, I cannot share because I'm not able, not being able yet. Can you yeah. allow me to share the host, please? Come for it. Okay, one moment. Uh, um, share the slide, is it? Yes. Share okay, the screen. Yeah, share the Yeah, you need to click at the bottom on the uh, share screen no, 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 tab no, no, no. and then on the side, enable participants to share their slides. That's how to enable the participants. Uh, yes, you can actually do that, actually, uh, share screen at the bottom. Yes, I cannot, I'm not being, I'm not yeah, being but yet. Comfori has to first enable yeah, you the have participants oh, okay. to do it. All right, uh, Otherwise. My, my bad. <laughs> All right, Mr. Zaini, I will put you under a maybe uh, co-host. And then see if you can uh, share. Yes. Ah, all right. My apologies right. That again. Okay, there we go. Okay, thank you very much. Let me start. I got about half an hour, right? So, all right. So, the topic is huge, basically, because energy efficiency is really a big topic, and in Malaysia, it's quite a lot of things you know uh, need to be looked into. But I try my very best to compress it into one half an hour, so that you can have some kind of Q and A. So this is what will be given to me to share the overview of the landscape and then with the Messi 2.0 and then where you know, in terms of area to invest, okay, programs that this will include the ESCO market, bond and all that, okay. And then how will be the NGPC monitoring framework, okay, in terms of the national level, even up to the organizational level and what's next. Okay, first of all, let me look, let me share with you about the, what we expect, you know, from Malaysia in terms of LCC sector until 2030, if you look here. If you look here, the trends until 2030, the capacity mix still very much depending on the fossil fuel. If you look here, mainly gas and coal. All right. Even if you're looking at this uh, forecasted here, forecast here, we expect to have more RE. Okay, the way forward. Okay, it's about over, over 20% by 2030. Okay. However, 
we're still depending very much on the depleted, you know, uh, so-called non-renewable energy sources such as the coal and gas. Therefore, energy efficiency has become more critical, okay, because as long as we are using fossil fuel, all right, we are emitting the GSD. Therefore, you like it or not, you know, other than cost factor, you have to manage this. We have to manage our energy uh, efficiently through energy efficiency. So you see, the, this is happening. Yeah, you cannot run away. This is happening where by 2030, based on this recent report by ST, okay, uh, by 2030, we are still depending very much on the gas and coal. And coal are not Malaysian, we all imported, and gas also getting lesser and lesser day by day. And then maybe may, many of you haven't, you know, seen this, right? I extracted this from the report. Okay. The cost to operate the, you know. Uh, the energy sector in Malaysia is it's not, it's not cheap. You see the operating cost alone, okay? It's talking about billion, okay? It's billion every year. Okay, even though this cost mainly borne by the utility company. However, if the, you know, the, the, the demand is getting higher, all right? And then, the, you know, the energy price is fluctuated, you know, globally. Right? And we are depending on very much gas and coal, which not much redu reduced, you know, despite the oil price getting lower now. All right. Like it or not, the way forward with the current more liberalized market in Malaysia, they have to pass the cost of the generation later, operation later to the consumer. And right? like it, whether you are domestic user, whether you are uh, industry player, whether you are commercial building, you will have to pay more for your energy. The way for if we, you know, if uh, we are not efficient, okay, of course, if you're not efficient, you have to pay, uh, we have to, uh, the impact will be uh, on you will be more and more. So, because the cost of running the AC sector in Malaysia, not only in Malaysia, in any other country, it's not cheap. You're talking about billions of ringgit, you know, it keeps increasing because Malaysia is still a developing country. And then, if you cannot uh, become efficient, we have to pay more for our energy the way forward, like it or not. Okay, now let's have a look in this. In terms of policies, okay, this is very interesting. Malaysia has a lot of energy related policies, but if you look here, if you look all these policies I listed here from 1974 until even now, okay, what a kind of policy? These policies has come, the, all these policies have one common feature. Okay, if you look at this policy from the Petroleum Development Act until the new energy policy in 2010, all right, if you look there from the all about supplying energy. That's why Malaysia has been very good as a developing country in supplying their energy for the people. The electrification rate in Malaysia almost 100% 24 hours. All right. But they look at this policy here. Why? Because all policies are about supplying energy. We are good in that. However, if you look here, none of this policy, none of this policy, okay, mentioned uh, the focus or objective is about how we supposed to use the energy? Okay, I mean, I can say here we have no national level energy efficiency policy yet. Okay, so so this this this, this is an issue, and it, and therefore we need one urgently. Without that, I think later I show to you why what's the effect of uh, not having the national level energy efficiency policy. It means that we are good in supply now, but we are very not very uh, i will i won't say very poor all right but we are not so good in utilizing our energy we are for the, actually in the demand side the user side we are wasting a lot and we haven't really done much again okay, into that okay in the new energy policy we was uh, somehow launched you know 2010 all right they have quite a good uh, quite holistic element here they have the pricing part supply part it got even they mentioned here about Egyptian sea part, okay, even the governance and other change management. Okay. However, when it comes to the execution, okay, to, to implement all these elements, five elements, this you have to have the ecosystem. Okay. I, I think we have a quite good ecosystem in terms of the supply side. Even now, the pricing side, we have now embarking on the ICPT, you know, and all that. Even we have now ETOU and all that. However, the ecosystem for number three, Egyptian sea which will we make the country in terms of user become more competitive in the market and also contributing to the low carbon economy, the ecosystem is not there yet. Therefore, when it comes to these five elements, the number three efficiency is still lagging far behind. Okay, even now in terms of supply, we are now big, uh, going big on the RE. You know, even we have the RE policy, we don't even have energy, 
change the policy yet. You know, when the last time member in 2018, okay, when the new government came in, suddenly they revived the target for RE target, you know, is from about 5%, okay, suddenly they can revive it up to 20% 20 by 2025. All right, so it can be done, but unfortunately, in the new energy policy, pillars number three is not, uh, hasn't got the ecosystem yet, you know, for it to grow as others. Okay, now let's talk about the Messi 2.0. Okay, the whole idea of Messi 2.0 is basically to reform our energy sector. Okay, if you look here, the Messi started 2010. Okay, Messi 1.0. Okay, Messi uh, 1.0, and somehow this is the car. Uh, in, in, uh, Messi 2.0, they start to do some changes. However, some elements, I think most of the element basically still basically monopolized. Okay, of course, you know by the uh, the NB. Just the, somehow they made some changes, and the generation part they start to be more open, but however still ring fence. Therefore, uh, after Messi 2.0 and 1.0, they embark on the nation embark on the Messi 2.0. Okay, we supposed to end this year. Okay, in this Messi 2.0, the market to become more open. Okay, more more player come on. If you look here, no longer TNB alone there. TNB has others to participate all right in every segment of the generations even from the fuel supply from generation from the grid from the transmission and all that even up to retail okay more players involved all right even the consumer can involve now because they can go for the net energy metering all right so therefore somehow they i think from compared to messi 2.0 uh, 1.0 and 2.0 messi 2.0 become uh, you know more players have, can come on board to participate in the LCT sector if you look here if you look at they got now in terms of the generation we got the wholesale market okay neda plus capacity market we got now no longer rings fence you know isb and we said isb stands for independent single buyer no longer a ring fence you know independent uh, grid system operator okay however some element must be still monopolized transmission is uh, the, 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 for example, the transmission, but for distribution, you know, they, they can have. We, now we are having more people distributing the electrical energy to to the consumers. It's something good somehow. All right, it's still can moving. So the whole idea of Messi 2.0 basically is to they have to get consumer has better experience in terms of choices. Okay, they can got better service level. Of course, the pricing now we got the ICPT. All right. So they got uh, the, uh, the the utility now can can submit their, their costing every six months and government have to review and if the value of the uh, generation cost you know lower than threshold value consumer can still got the lower price you know but however if the threshold value okay of the generation cost you know higher of the threshold value they have to pay more so means that if you are not efficient they have to pay more all right if you use more you pay more simple as that okay compared to used to be everything being subsidized and then another one, the, the number three is to, uh, it can generate more when, when more players on board, okay, there will be more uh, economic activities, especially for the SMEs. If you look here now, uh, now we got a lot of people involved in the solar PV installations, okay, because a lot of the whole value chain will be contributing to the economic activities. All right, so the whole idea of MAC 2.0 to achieve efficiency is that generators has to be competitive in terms of the uh, fuel costing and all that, okay. So no more, you know, uh, they enhance the ring fence system for the single buyer and grid system operator, and we can become more green as well. Okay, in fact, even now it's easier to get our renewable energy on the at the home compared to used to be. Not only you, for, you even for the industry player, you know, for the industry sector, they can put the solar PV, you know, with the proper guidelines. All all being being prepared now, and then of course better consumer consumer customer experience, of course the security part. So somehow the way I look at it, you know. Uh, Messi has, in overall for me, has achieved most of these objectives. But the only issues now, the only challenge now, what next? How we can take it from here? All right. So when it comes to the demand side, okay, demand side. Okay, so when we improve, okay, even though the for the Messi 2.0, all right, the focus more on the supply side. You know, somehow the demand side basically is something, you know, something that is the uh, the impact of the improvement of the supply side, okay? But when it, when you it improve on the demand side, okay, that will be complementary to the supply side because if a consumer become more energy efficient, right, there is lesser requirement or uh, not that urgent requirement to add more capacity. 
for there be a lesser new power plant or the, the, new, the, the building of the new power plant can be you know, can be delayed further okay and then of course even if you look at the, even at the ASEAN level okay so the, 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 somehow ASEAN has got their own uh, you know, uh, targets now in terms of energy efficiency improve the demand side okay if you look here ASEAN they got they got they got APAI okay ASEAN plan action of the energy corporations 20 until 2025 okay ASEAN has got the target by 20 uh, intensity, by intensity, okay, 20% by 2020 and by 30% uh, by 2025, okay. So this is the target for ASEAN, and the best part of that, you know, what are the measures they are focusing on, okay? If you look here, they they started to for the industry sector, they started to harmonize, okay, a lot of things, standards, guidelines, all that, and then some country got even the act, you know. Describe the practice, you know, what the industry place, industrial sectors must do in the managing energy, and they got now maps as well. And for building sector, come on, they got a standard for buildings, okay? Audit, you know, providing energy audit grant and all that, benchmarking, preparing building codes, okay, trainings and so on, and of course awareness program. And if you look all this all, all, all these uh, uh, key initiatives by ASEAN, I would say all the initiatives are common. It's all applicable to most of the all other country in uh, Asia, not only Asia, in other part of the uh, of the world as well, because it's all common area focus area. In fact, in terms of standard, we refer to basically global standards. Okay, therefore, most country in ASEAN they got the uh, EE plan and strategies. Okay, and then of course another one, most of the country in ASEAN, the energy sector in terms of electricity still uh, subsidized. Okay, that's why this is another very as well. However, from country to country in ASEAN, different country they got, when we talk about the E plan, some very holistic means that they got the policy, they got the, the act, they got everything on board. Some, they just got a plan. Therefore, in terms of uh, performance, in terms of achievement, different country have different level of achievement. Okay. Now let's look at this, okay? What are the barrier to efficiency? Okay, the first of all is market barrier. Okay, you know market for example price okay and then uh, pricing okay the the, the acceptance of the market so uh, how they suit, uh, how they see efficiency financial as well okay and you can see needs money okay I can say in Malaysia now we don't have that much support in terms of financing even there has there there are some but for renewable energy is yes but for energy can see it's still very much not very attractive and then awareness I think awareness is something that we can have to do ongoing. Okay, and then another one part, another part in Malaysia is our regulatory requirement still very much, I would say, very very minimal compared to other country in ASEAN, and and technical barrier. But however, I think technical barrier is something that is not that is not that difficult to overcome because people can be trained easily. And the best part of efficiency, technologies for efficiency is not so much so much complicated. It's not so called you know, uh, sophisticated thing. It's very simple. For example, variable speed drive, you know, it's been there for the past almost 40 years. It's nothing new. It's a matter of how more how efficient they are. Okay, and then how to overcome that? Okay, so how how policy? So that's why when you have no policy, all right. So because when you have the national level policy, especially, okay, we can have this uh, uh, sub uh, uh, policy at different 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 element. Okay, we can uh, control the pricing. Okay, we can. When you have the policy, we can develop the comprehensive law. Okay, we can mandate you know requirement for especially for the large energy users. Okay, and we can have fiscal incentive. Okay, to support you know uh, for big investment, and we can have more long term and well planned promotion, ongoing promotion to the public. We can keep continuing develop the technology. Okay, we can continue the capacity development and for the financial part. Okay, this is what happening in Malaysia now because of that. Uh, you know. The absence of the national policy is quite is quite uh, challenging. I would say it's difficult, of course, difficult. Okay, it's quite challenging to do efficiency when it comes to investment. Okay, at the large scale, large scale. Okay, you can do it at a small scale within your own budget, but when it comes to the large scale, you know, it's difficult, a bit more challenging because, for example, I came across a few state government, right, and then the local authorities, uh, municipal, and all that. You know, when they want to embark on big time, they want to even to allocate the budget for uh, this kind of activity and efficiency. They often ask me, is, it, is there any federal level policy we can look into, we can follow? Because that's how governments work, for example. 
Okay, similar to the private sector, they will ask, you know, is there any uh, attractive uh, fiscal incentive? You know, there are some, but you know, there are some uh, challenges in that as well because it's actually in the processing, it's taking too long. Okay, so this is what this is how okay policy will help. Okay, policy at the national level will help because okay. The most important part for Malaysia, I would say, we need to have this. You need to focus when we have the policy national level. If you have one, you can focus on the improve our regulatory requirement and control mechanism, and also focus on the financial part. Okay, this is two key element for me. Okay, because the rest is there now, all it can be improved. Okay, so what's the impact if no national level policy for indigency? Okay, the first one, there will be no dedicated long term funding sources. Okay, because energy uh, efficiency plan normally take 10 years, you know, 10 years to, to, to show the real result. Okay, but what happening is Malaysia now, every year, every agency has to wait the budget speech, whether they can get a budget or not. When this happens, it's difficult for businesses, even for businesses, right? Even to plan because it's no guarantee. There'll be ongoing support in terms of funding and all that. Okay, and then another one, no accountability. Okay, if you go to Malaysia now, if you want to do something on agency, you have to go for, you have to go, you have to meet up with several agencies. For example, if you want to ask for the request, apply for the fiscal incentive, for the green fiscal incentive. At least I can guarantee you have to meet at least four or five agencies. Okay, and then another one, no dedicated and comprehensive legal framework. Now we have a law, okay, they call it, you know, Efficient Management of Legal and Regulation 2008. But the provision is very limited and also not prescriptive enough, you know, as a guide for the affected installation to take further action. And we have another law, part of the existing law under the uh, Civil Education 24, where we started to uh, put up the labeling for the appliances. Okay, that's uh, because we have. We, that's why we need to have that comprehensive legal framework and the provisions. Okay, and then next one. It's be, uh, I would say no, but maybe lack of the shared commitment among ministries and agencies. Okay. For example, I remember when the Kementerian, the Ministry of Energy tried to pursue the energy performance contracting within government building. Okay. The response from other agencies or ministries are very, very different. Are very, I would say, very, very sad. Okay. Until now. Until now. It's not being resolved for the past almost 10 years. And then the last one with no policy level, okay, we may have the plan, okay, we may have some plan, okay, but we don't have that long term uh, programs, you know, we can achieve the goals and we have to, you know, for the market to, to, to look into and we can start to synchronize the plan with that. It's no clear long term goal. Now we have the so called national efficiency action plan, but with the plan doesn't come with the confirmed financial support year to year basis until 2025. Even though we have a quite a good plan there. Okay, that's the impact. Therefore, for me, it's very, very important. You know, it's very, very crucial, very, very uh, important for Malaysia to have this kind of national level policy on the energy efficiency. Okay, again, you know, what are the problems in Malaysia to embark on energy efficiency? On energy efficiency? The, I think the, the, the barrier is almost the same. If you look at the uh, slide I showed just now, that one at the global level based on the IEA report, okay, but this is actually the four barriers in Malaysia confirmed by Malaysia through the study, study you know, executed by the, by the government themselves. This study headed by me, 2016-2017, we have confirmed these are the barriers. First, we are lacking of funding sources and financing mechanism, and we don't have the dedicated agency or entity to oversee the whole agency of TT in Malaysia, and then we empowered you know, entity, and then the Overall action plan is fragmented, you know, because the, the Ministry of Energy, they got their action plan, you know. Even the, the other ministry, they got their own so-called sustainability plan, part cover agency as well. So it's fragmented. All right? It's no single uh, accountable entity to monitor all that and compile everything to put into one uh, to tell, to share with us, you know, where we are now and how we move forward. And finally, we didn't have that comprehensive energy efficiency and conservation law. It's now being drafted. Okay, I share with you later. Okay, this is it's an urgent. Okay, these are key barriers. So if Malaysia wanted to, yeah, to to embark and to 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 have, to embark further and then to get, enjoy more benefit from efficiency, these are the barriers, and we know how to remove this. 
Okay, we know how to remove this. Okay, the first one I'm finding, in fact, in the study, there, will, there are some options, you know, presented to the government. So what kind of funding, you know, government can opt, you know, when it comes to agency. For example, in Thailand, they have the NCON fund. Okay, they are collecting about almost 300 to 400 US, uh, million US dollar per year for their national level program every year. So it's confirmed source and confirmed budget every year for their program and plan. Okay, that's what in Malaysia we suggested here. Okay, there are some options either, of course, you know, to get from the federal budget, you know, totally, maybe not, not, not feasible, but you have some combination here, government election plus the funding parties, all right, even, even we recommend here to get some kind of similar to Thailand, levy, go all, all green tax and all that. So there are some options and this option, you know, I would say it has been proven in many other markets, you know, so up to Malaysia now, so which option they wanted to pursue and then start to do it. Otherwise, you know, no funding, you know, we can, you can do something, but we can do big time. All right. This is some uh, element. So if you have a funding, they must be adequate. Okay. Adequate and, you know, guaranteed and then must be stable. Okay. Stable means that guaranteed. Okay. Autonomy means that the agency who are responsible must be able to control and manage that purely on agency programs and then the funding must be credible, okay, the origin, okay, of course, you know, come from the government and other whatever means, you know, government uh, identified and of course, it won't create the distortive effect. For example, if they use the fund to create a so-called, you know, revolving fund, you know, somehow the, the mechanism shouldn't disturb the other uh, normal commission, uh, funding in the market, you know, for the, they won't disturb the banking sector. All right, this is about the funding. And then in, for RE, okay, in RE, uh, for energy emission in RE, even, you know, just uh, this 20% target just being revived in 2019. Okay, so if, if you want to do it, we can do it because uh, remember in 2019, we set a target from 5% target RE, we remove, revive into 20% by 2025. So my, 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 <laughs> my argument here, if there is some will or political will especially, we can do this, you know, we can do it for RE, so why can't we do it for EE? Simple as that. Okay, and if you even here, if you are now, I think I think the RE market in Malaysia is more in more uh, so called you know, lively now. It's got a lot of things happening, and a lot of avenue for every party. You know the financing sector, you know uh, industry player, even the user, the new consumer can come. They say glad we have the Seco programs. You know for the solar, for example, net energy metering, large scale solar. You know for and all that. So even the mechanism of the how to, uh, you know, how to fund the pro programs and all that. So it's quite very well structured. So we need to have something for agency like this, something firm and clear and everyone can come on board, you know, to play their role. Okay, bear in mind in the energy efficiency, uh, in the energy efficiency sector, this is the three element is the disturbing the sector now. Electrification, yeah, expect, you know, we're talking about electric, uh, electric vehicle, be prepared for more energy demand, okay? And then now, di digitalization, okay? We're talking more of more smart grid now, smart meters and all that, R4.0 as well. And then, of course, more, it started to become more decentralized now, okay? So, consumer can have the option now to have their own uh, choice, you know, in terms of power supply as well. All right, so there's a lot of things happening. These are all the three elements we identified by the ministry that will disturb the current conventional, you know, uh, uh, energy supply industry. All right. And of course, this digitalization will be more and more, you know, uh, the way for even now, consumer can check their bill, you know, from their apps on the smartphone. Okay, now what are the key uh, ways to invest and what are the key programs now in Malaysia in terms of energy efficiency? Just to share with you, Globally, eh? globally for the energy service industry, the size is quite huge. Okay, if you look here, it's a total of the size, you know, uh, about 30 billion in 2013. Okay, and key players in this energy service is ESCO. All right, ESCO. So if you look at other region, okay, this industry is big. You're talking about billions. Okay, this is what I can manage to get from the uh, Lawrence Berkeley reports, okay, 2013. Okay, look at the ESCO market itself. Okay, this is research by, done by the uh, CIMB sometimes ago, and then of course the source of course, they got its source from the IA and all that. Okay, if you look here, instead of bond, if you look at here, the global bond size for 
okay for the esco okay esco here for the energy sector energy efficiency sector here okay is increasing okay from 2015 until 2018 if but if we look here with the total size of in 2018 the the the, the size of the bond is about 500 US dollar billion US dollar okay the total bond size okay but only 0.5 percent okay on the NG efficiency okay and if you look at ASEAN okay if you look at ASEAN Malaysia you know it's not the biggest one okay we're not bigger the biggest is Indonesia okay and then if you look at you know where this EE bond going going okay okay mainly for okay yeah, so for the ESCO, ESCO market alone, globally is about 30 billion, and China uh, is a part of more than 50% of that. And the, the area of the EE for the bond focusing on the building sector. Okay, so building sector has enormous potential. Okay, so this is where the so this is the, the current overview of the snapshot of the bond, okay, bond market, you know, for ESCO in particular. So this is where you can look into. So, so this conference is very nice because building sector is the key. So far, based on the, the trend, the, the way that, because I think because of the building sector, the, in terms of solution, is quite straightforward. It's quite more, more simpler compared to even industrial sector. Okay, more proven as well. For example, you're talking about building, you know, 70% of your energy going to your ecosystem. And improving improvement of the ecosystem is quite well-known technologies. Less doubt in terms of the, the performance and all that. All right, and then where to invest, where to focus in Malaysia? Again, there's two sectors, building and industrial sector. Because we expect Malaysia energy consumption for these two sectors will keep increasing and they're using all kind of energy. But for the building sector, they're more on the electrical energy alone. Okay, so it's quite straightforward. Okay, and then the biggest part, you know, I think the most integrated part for the energy sector, okay, for the ESCO, uh, for the energy efficiency for building, Okay, which where you know the uh, the where the money you know the big money involved basically when you, when you do to, when you start to embark on the energy performance contracting whatever model you choose. However, okay, in Malaysia there's a lot of barriers to be overcome. If you look here, I can I can I can summarize here. We got some policy decision actually for the because we have to start EPC at the government sector to set the tone. This is how other countries doing it. If you look at US, okay, if you look and even in uh, other country. They started with the government sector. From there, the private sector start to look as the proven case. Okay, because another one when they start to the government sector, it gives so much benefit to the government. But we, however, we still have a lot of issue to be resolved. We have to go have got a policy to mandate the government, the buildings, the procurement issue. Still now, uh, for federal government, they are not allowed to pay as school because no payment mechanism. Okay, the process, you know, the procurement process. See not resolved, no tender process, no guideline and all that. And the contract template still not available to be adopted or to be looked as a reference. Financings. The current financing is still very much like a typical conventional financing, which is not attractive for ESCO because ESCO are SMEs. They are knowledge-based service. Okay, they are not big. They don't have that so much collateral. Financing, you know, we have to get some kind of like Thailand, revolving fund, you know. And then ESCO registration, we need to have a much more proper Recession for ESCO, which not, not everyone can become ESCO because not everyone can play the game of APC. And then implementing agency. No one-stop center yet now. And finally, of course, you know, we have to come up more and more success projects in Malaysia. Okay, don't worry, this slide will be given to all of you. Okay. For the for Malaysia, we have commitment. Okay, we got the target, you know, uh 20 by 2030, 35, uh 45% GSG emission reduction. And how we can contribute? I can tell you, you know, and you can see can contribute a lot. How through your practices and also through your technologies. So this is how we contribute in terms of you can see. Okay. And we have the action plan. Okay. Maybe you have heard about this. Okay. We got action plan. Okay. To achieve the to help to achieve this target. Okay. And you achieve your action plan. But this action plan only for electrical energy alone. Okay, and we have a target for this, only eight percent. Okay, okay. When I saw this, you know, why eight percent? Why we can put more target for that? We can more ambitious. Okay, okay. So that if you look here, 
the key initiative in the action plan almost the same like you know what we see in the ASEAN just now. Okay, uh, five star rated maps, audit, and all that. Okay, even co generations and also building design to the codes. Okay, quite common uh, initiative. Of course, now we got the energy audit grant, okay, 2.0 version. Now Malaysian can apply for this grant. But for this time around, only applicable for companies falls under the regulations, okay, under MA 2008 for Sabah and Peninsula, and also for Sarawak, any uh, user that uses use more than 3 million kilowatt hour in six months. So you can apply now, actually, you go to Seda website, you can apply now. This is the 2.0 version because the, the, the first version in uh, 12, 11 mission plan was very successful. Therefore, government extended this one. Okay, now government allocated, if you're not mistaken, about 80 over million, okay, for the next five years for the energy audit grant, if you're not mistaken. Okay, so if you're a large user, apply now, okay, through SEDA. And then, of course, we are now, the nation now drafting the Act, okay. The Act is supposed to be tabled to Parliament in 2020, second half, because of the COVID. I was told yesterday, I just met somebody from the ministry yesterday, they said it's all, they submitted to AG already, Attorney General Office. So we, we hope that we can get it, you know, presented to the parliament, of course, after October, after the, so-called, you know, after the darurat, <laughs> all right? Hopefully parliament will be sitting. Okay, so we are we are going to have the act. And the act, you can expect, will be more comprehensive, and more uh, prescriptive for, for everyone to become uh, more clear on what to do, as required by the law. And then we got the funding, you know, to 2017, all right? But I would say this funding, uh, by MDV, but the take up for EE is still very much lesser. I was I was told that the the funding so far mostly go to the RE project, which is more 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 more, more uh, getting the funding. EE is still very little. You got incentive now. The incentive extended until 2023. You can apply now, but I can tell you the process won't be that won't be that short. Okay, be prepared. All right, you can apply to SEDA. Okay. Sorry, not said that to Maida and also MG, Malaysia Green Tech, you know, uh, MGTC. And the last one of my presentation, okay, how are we supposed to monitor energy efficiency? Okay, the last one. Okay, for the, at the national level, we need to have this, the whole element of this. Okay, we have to have this. In particular, the law and the funding mechanism. Okay, and, but now, what we have now, we have the action plan. Okay, in Malaysia, but we don't have the other element, therefore, Energy efficiency is not moving. So that's why not only not moving, we also, whatever we have done, okay, we can't even get, monitor, and compile all the data and tell us where we are now. Even the data that being being presented now, easily I can question it. You know, because it's it's no, you know, I, I can I can question the accountability of the data because of the uh, how it's being collected. So that's why for at the national level, you have to have the governance, you know, for us to monitor and implement the the other program so that we can get you can tell you know where we are okay this is the element we need to have the enabling frameworks we need to have the institutional arrangement also we need to have the connecting mechanism all right and then this is the proposed you know structure for malaysia as proposed in the report you know provided by the message in 2019 this is more holistic structure of the governance and we come to implementation if you look here and uh, this time the report shows Keta now Ketsa. <laughs> All right. Okay. And then you should have this. You know what? Now in ST, they have only about 12 officers. Okay. To look into the demand side of the whole country and you see, it's not sufficient. Okay. I was there last time. Okay. That's why this is the, I would say, the more comprehensive setup for any entity assigned by government to look into the energy efficiency in the country. Cover all elements here, regulatory, technical support and labeling and data training and all that all right and the trend now they are moving toward more digital okay so now even engine management start to look into how you can monitor real time and all that so now the big bear in mind digitalization is something that have to be part of the ee the way forward okay it's been proven okay and now we're talking about iot all right you cannot run away from this okay iot so the market is growing Okay. okay, even China is taking the lead now in terms of IoT growing market. Okay, this is how we can apply EE for in the IoT in the the overall uh, market. Okay, you look at the smart buildings. You know how we can respond as a as, as a demand. Okay, for the utility and also how we can apply more energy efficiency. Even now, I think 
but for now okay we started to see the impact now with more smart grid in malaysia okay even we now we started to look into more more smart building now as well but all this now we can uh, add iot on top of that you can make it easier for us to make instant decision based on the analyzed data okay compared to the just bms you know where it's isolated the building itself all right so this is where you can uh, adopt iot and of course iot involve all the features okay we got smart meter sensors you know where you can do more on the to monitor your energy efficiency not just to improve it also to monitor the performance if you look here so this is the future okay this is the future of energy efficiency is covered all here in talking about how you how you can through the smart system you can implement okay you can control you also can monitor you can also report and all basically based on real-time data okay on the spot analysis and you can make on the spot instant decision on the way forward this is the somehow the how uh, what this company visualize it in the way forward okay it's all digitalized it's all connected okay if you look here from the supply here generation here okay and then uh, even you can adopt also renewable energy okay you can adopt uh, ev you can adopt smart home you can use your own net metering and all that so all connected so this is the way forward i hope you can see this example in melaka very soon okay in the next five to ten years you know because they are the pilot project in melaka now in icro so TMB is embarking on that so this is the way forward okay i think more cities in china having this kind of concept now even it's there already now all right so this is at the uh, this is at the bigger level this is at the let's say at the organization level similar you can adopt you know more digital uh, digital uh, application here if you look here you have the center here the information system here and you can control everything from from the loads here lighting acmv and all that you can even you can control your md here this example of one of my projects you know last time because all is you know on time uh, uh, online real time and digitalized okay in fact we monitor this one last time from the for our office not at the site okay so what next this is, this is my last slide so what what's next okay what's next so what's next we need to grow ngc as an industry we cannot grow as a program as a project we need to grow as an industry this is where if we grow as an industry you have to include the you have to focus sector you have to focus the sector you have to involve the industry player and we have to involve the consumer so you cannot run away from this okay and then from there how to make the industry grow we have to prepare the enough will okay you need to have the strong governance and regulatory you need to have the financing and fiscal incentive you need to have the competent and accountable agency to look into everything information education awareness everything and finding the r d from there the result will be you know for industry player you know for, for for people like me you know industry player we need we do we do need the government money okay we need to have the infrastructure and we can take it from there and the impact of that basically of course create more jobs create more investment more high level, high skill workers experts you know new source of income new source of growth economy and of course more direct domestic investment okay more than domestic investment. with that thank you very much all right so this is my contact so now we can open for q a if you got time all right. all right yes thanks Saini. yeah we have a little bit of time uh because we started a, a bit late and uh great overview is it correct to say that um there have there has been progress on the policy framework but we are not yet there. We are still kind of lagging behind. Uh, you identified the barriers. A lot of them haven't been overcome yet. Even though energy efficiency might be the best fuel available for us because of the great returns in terms of jobs, in terms of efficiency, we are yet still a, a little bit far away from properly harvesting it effectively. You mentioned the money is going to renewable rather than to energy efficiency and um, what could be done in the next two three years to accelerate this um, in terms of policy and how are we doing Malaysia compared to ASEAN countries in terms of uh, let's say building energy efficiency index you made some comparison but it would be good to hear are we you know lagging behind as well in terms of the power consumption per square meter for standard office or industrial buildings compared to ASEAN average? Okay, to answer the question, I think, uh, first of all, I would like, I think 
I, I must be proud of being Malaysian because in Malaysia, when it comes to efficiency, right? I think I would say with that, despite with all that, you know, with all the barriers, it's still not overcome yet, you know? We, we must thank the private sector because they're still moving to it. They have to, they're still moving towards that because they have no choice because of the business requirement. But somehow we have to appreciate that, you know, despite, you know, all that compared to other country, you know, despite all that lack of this and this, right? Lack from away, we still move forward. That's why you can see, you know, in general, we still can win some awards and even ASEAN. <laughs> all right, simple like that. Despite that, you know, comparatively in terms of how the ecosystem is totally different. We are still far lagging in terms of the ecosystem. So what I would say, the way forward, okay, the only thing I hope, you know, even before I, I don't think I know I'm going to retire or not, okay. <laughs> so we have to keep pushing. At least we need to have a, a long term. I mentioned in my slide, policy, the national level policy is very crucial. Okay, for me, it's very crucial because I was in the government. Okay, I was in the government for almost 10 years. I can see what the impact, you know, even within the government, you know, if you have no national level policy, a lot of things cannot, cannot move on. It can, it can do, but it's, it's very in terms of micro level, short term and all that. Okay. In fact, in fact, we much bigger at the private sector or that. So when I left the government, I was not in the private sector. Now I can see why sometimes we keep blaming the government, the department agency or that, and not their fault. Because of that, the missing, if you look at any country, all started from the national level policy. And from there, they go down to the, 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 the framework, the law, the, the budgeting and all that. And all this how government is being run. And we are, we are also, Malaysia is a government, you know, we, Malaysia is not a planet, just, uh, you know, we are government as well. So, so without that, I would say, it's difficult. It's, it can be done, but much more difficult. I think pity for even for my friend in the government, even pity for my fellow industry player. Things are more difficult for them compared to our neighbors, you know. You know, they are more lucky. <laughs> right? But say some well, lucky or not, we have to compete in the same market. You know, we have to compete in terms of market, we have to compete in terms of consumer, you know, we have to export our product. You know? For the same market, we have to send to Europe, we have to send to China, similar. But our own backyard in terms of ecosystem is much more much tougher. So yeah. pity mission, industry player. That's my answer for that. Good, good. And how are we doing in comparison, let's say, uh, kilowatt hours of power consumption Malaysia per square meter no per year? Uh, we have no benchmark data. Mm. Okay. In fact, I, I propose a study under the, uh, the the special fund to carry out the national level benchmarking study to accept the benchmark for, in that, for building sector as a start, as a start mm. at least. I was told the, the proposal was approved. Because of COVID, it cannot get the letter of the execution yet. Mm. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Now we don't have any benchmark. That's why I cannot compare. All right. I All right. Compare. No one yeah. can compare in Malaysia where we are not so that kind of benchmarking. Yeah. I remember I saw some data for Putrajaya, and I think our friends from IEN, they put some data together as well on some of the uh, most efficient buildings, but maybe they'll they can elude on that. Uh, we have a comment from Chris in the uh, comment section here. Uh, hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Uh, agree that policy is important, but uh, IMHO, our awareness is not up to the level because of failure of our educational system. Hmm. That's interesting. Chris is saying we need to do something about the educational system. Uh, what's your comment on that, Saini? Okay, for information, okay. I was involved in this as well. Even in fact, at the, at the school level now, all right, mm -hmm. there are syllabus in RE and EE started way back in 2010. I was involved in championing that, you know, somehow lucky, you know. Now, at the, if you look at the, the secondary school now, okay, even uh, they got the syllabus on that. Even my wife is a teacher teaching that as well now. All right. So there is something, but somehow, they, they, I think it's a good start. There, there are something in the, in the system already. But somehow, if you go after, after schools, Okay, even after you graduated, all right, it's no uh, proper avenue to practice still the same. Again, come to the policy, how the policy can shape the industry for people to practice. I would say so, the basics, you know, the basics for, for school level, I, I must, uh, you know, I must commend the Ministry of Education for accepting this many years ago to be part of the current system. It, it, there is, I can guarantee you there is. All right, but oh. what next? What next? Yes. Okay, it, well, after, it, after they know the knowledge, right? You know, just similar like children, right? You teach mm -hmm. how to pray, never see the parents pray. They won't pray. 
simple as like that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That's my so, comment. That. Yeah, I think uh, when Chris went to school, it didn't happen, but now it's yeah, happening. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Uh, we have two more questions here, but please give quite uh, quick answers on those. Okay. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next uh, uh, presenter, which is Austin. I see him uh, ready to go already on the screen. Uh, we have the question from Gregors. What is your thinking on implementing a carbon dioxide tax uh, for Malaysia? How high should it be? And I guess then to use it for EE projects. I think that was part of your presentation suggestion already. And then the other question is from Dayang. Um, asking, can you give an example on public funds and what is decentralized peer-to-peer? -peer? Those are kind of free questions. Try and answer them in three minutes, please, and then we'll move on to the next presentation. Thanks, okay. Saini. First question from Gregor. I'm on for it. You know, for carbon tax, I'm being, I'm a very, I'm the strong advocate for that because, but however, okay, realistically, I, I don't see Malaysian market already for that. It's really the business sector. All right, they are not really ready for that. But I think for some multinational, yes, they are. They are ready for that because they have been doing it for any other country. All right, that's my question. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm on for that. Even that's why that's one of the recommendation in the, in the, in the, uh, the even the study that we commenced, you know, uh, about two, two, three years back. How high should it be per ton of CO two? How high? I can, no. I can, I can take the quantum now. All right, mm. the quantum can be discussed, but I'm okay for that. In fact, it's most, much more, uh, much more strong voices to, for that now within the, within the, even within the government. Because that's another way we can uh, get some kind of, you know, uh, pay the polluters, you know, polluters pay concept. All right? Yeah. You, 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 you pollute more, pay more. Yeah, it's not free. Because we are sharing the same, 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 same earth, you know, same sky. All yeah. right? <laughs> and the public fund for EE building services, any example on that? For Where's public funding, basically, for, for public funding, is, uh, when you're talking about public funding, it's more under the funding for the, let's say, for government, right? To embark on the programs, you know? Let's say awareness, trainings, and all that. Create the ecosystem, create the fund, create the operation of the agency and all that. Okay, not for the, uh, to give for private sector to invest. More, to, I would say, administrative part of the, the whole thing. All right? Uh, more on that promotion, awareness, you know? You can expect, you know? There must be some kind of ongoing promotion from the government ongoing basis. So there must the budget coming from the public funding. This is where you can utilize the tax and all that. Not for uh, to give a loan to the private sector. Okay, something like that. Okay. So I think the peer-to-peer -peer you see in the one of the MSC 2.0 just now, right? Okay, is it right, right? Something like that. So basically, there's a concept where you know where you can between let's say between one factory to one factory. If they got a system, you know, smart system, they can understand the load very well. Okay, they know at certain time this the neighboring factory don't need to have that much load. There might there's, there are sometimes the, the, the other factory need the load, so they can share that. They create a microgrid system, and they can share they can exchange between themselves without any uh, additional uh, from the national grid. They call it peer to peer concept. Okay, so you can have a system, but the system actually is smart system. You must have the smart grid facility. We have the smart meter and all that, so that you can have that kind of uh, uh, arrangement between, let's say, user to user. All right. Even even from utility to utility, you know, you know this this whatever now in, in in northern side, you have the northern uh, node they got TMB. They can they can exchange their load, you know, depending on the requirement of the different area. They can complement each other. That's my answer for that. All right, great. Thank you so much, Saini. One big applause, either through, Thank you know, visual hands or maybe the, the electronic digital hands. We are talking about digitalization. We do right. the digital clap as well. So yeah. thanks so much for a great start uh, in the morning. Sure, sure, sure. And uh, now we have Mr. Austin Lim. He's a certified green re-manager and green building index facilitator at our friends at IEN Consulting, Sidor and Berhard. He will talk about system level technology opportunities, smart controllers, communication capabilities. What are the opportunities there at the big picture level? And what about you know smart building controls, uh, efficiency? Uh, he will give us the big picture overview. I'm really looking forward to that. So we have uh, 45 minutes in total, Austin, for your session. 30 minutes for the presentation and then 15 minutes for Q&A. 
Over to you, Austin. Welcome to our event. Thank you, Matthias. Morning, everyone. So let me share my screen. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. All right. Uh, the host disabled participants share screen. All, all right. right. Uh, let me just uh, change on that. <laughs> right. Okay. Let me just show you as co-host. All right. You should be able to share it right now. Uh, yes. There we go. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay, so morning everyone. So uh, my section will be system level technology opportunities and uh, I'm from IEM Consultants. So before we start, uh, I would like to talk a bit about my background. Uh, I work as a green building consultant or you can call it the environmental sustainable design consultant at IEM Consultants at Bihar. Bahad. My internship at ACOM uh, as an environmental consultant trainee under the environment department allowed me to explore on various uh, environmental safety and health, or we call it ESH, regulation, and also the land contamination management, uh, like uh, phase one or phase two environmental site assessment. After the completion of my internship, I joined a uh, green building industry, uh, and at the same time, I pursued a master degree in renewable energy. I joined IEN in 2019 and has been focusing on solar photovoltaic thermal, or we call it PVT, radiant cooling, rainwater harvesting, building thermal transfer, indoor or outdoor thermal comfort, and daylighting. So uh, at IEM, I have the opportunity uh, to in managing various types of projects from small to large scale, including private bungalow, community center, toll plaza, service apartment, office tower, hotel, shopping mall, and uh, hospital. So I am also an active member of uh, Green Drinks KL, which is same as Matthias and Gregor's. And also um, the Learning Affiliate Team Lead of uh, Energy Institute Malaysia. Okay, so we enter our topic, the system level technology opportunities. So the diagram over here shows the current, the existing uh, grid system and also the futures, uh, future grid system that we need in the future. So the left hand side is our grid, uh, existing grid system, which is the single directional type connecting building to a centralized uh, energy supply. The energy consumption is monitored by conventional meter, which you see uh, require manual reading by a TNB personnel. The system on the right-hand side is the uh, grid system that we need in the future, which provide bi-directional transmission. Uh, smart meter shall be installed for the ease of communication between the demand side and also the supply side. The existing grid system shall be upgraded in order to cater more and more uh, renewable energy uh, or storage system in the future. Okay, one simple example that we can uh, talk about this uh, smart grid and also system level technology is we, we are having increasing number of uh, EV, which is the electric vehicle. So we need this bi-directional. Uh, EV will play an important role in the future. So not only for transportation, but also serve as a um, stock energy storage. During EV charging, the power will be transmitted from the grid to the battery storage. However, in some occasions, it is possible to feed back the power from the uh, EV storage to the utility grid as well. So I'll explain more on this throughout the section. Okay, the clean disruption is our first topic. So what does uh, clean disruption mean? Uh, it basically means that all the new and clean technology will cause the disruption and sweep away all the conventional or fossil fuel based uh, technology in the energy or uh, transportation sector. Just like how our history is uh, created. Uh, for example, the stone age did not end because humankind ran out of the stone. It ended because rocks were disrupted by a superior technology called bronze. So stone didn't just disappear. They just become obsolete for tool making purpose in the bronze age. Same for our horses and our carriage era. It did not end because we ran out of horses. It ended because horses' uh, transportation was disrupted by a superior technology called the internal combustion engine. Horses didn't just disappear. They just became uh, obsolete for the purpose of mass transportation. So this is going to be the same for our conventional energy. The age of conventional energy sources will not just end because we ran out of petroleum uh, natural gas, coal, or uranium. 
it will end because the energy sources will be disrupted by the superior energy such as a uh, solar, wind, battery, and maybe the self-driving cars. Since the last decade, the cost of solar, wind, and battery, or we call it SWB in this case, uh, has fell off a cliff, making the cost of this new SWB system cheaper than the existing conventional plant, such as coal, gas, nuclear, or we call it CGN over here. Falling costs drive the technology disruption. Uh, solar and wind are already the cheapest new generation option. The cost of SWB system here uh, will fall another 70% by 2030, making this disruption inevitable. And existing CGN asset will be stranded. Okay, so here's a study that showed the evaluation of the relative cost of a new PV and coal. Comparing the levelized cost of, cost of electricity, the LCOE, you will realize there are arrows over here. So the blue end of the arrow shows the cost in 2015, and the red end shows the cost in 2019. All the arrows here uh, on the graph are pointing toward the left side, meaning the LCOE difference between PV and coal is getting smaller and smaller. If the arrow passed through the neutral line over here, which is a zero LCOE difference, meaning PV is already cheaper than coal. Most of the country has achieved a lower cost of the PV as shown in the yellow box over here. So what about Malaysia? Since we have been investing uh, mostly in solar PV for the transition to renewable energy. The cost of coal still remains slightly cheaper uh, for, than PV, but we can see that since 2015, the price has reduced for more than 70%. Uh, and it is also noticed that Thailand is moving towards uh, and closer and closer to the neutral line. A situation that is uh, likely to have been uh, further improved since its publication. The reason why coal remains cheaper in Southeast Asia is because the study did not factor in this field uh, environmental externality we should be uh, the true cost of coal, uh, such as the health damage of uh, coal plants, effect of CO2 emission, damage from climate change, ocean acidification and eutrophication, and, ocean, uh, and also the ocean current shift. Okay, so moving on to the global 100% renewable energy by 2030 strategy. Earlier this year, a group of uh, energy experts had organized a joint declaration of this uh, global 100% renewable energy strategy, which basically say that uh, the transformation to 100% RE is possible by uh, 2030. Uh, and it will occur faster than current expectation. It is both physically possible and also economically uh, affordable to meet this 100% of electricity demand with the combination of the SWB we mentioned just now, solar, wind, and battery. And this will be the cheapest available option for the new power generation on the time frame to 2030. And in many cases, it will be less uh, cheap, ex less expensive than opt continuing to operate uh, the existing conventional plant. So uh, the graph over here you see is, uh, the, we call it the clean energy U curve. So this clean energy U curve uh, actually uh, captures the re trade off relationship between the electricity generation and the energy storage. And it is also a valuable tool for, under, uh, for both understanding how 100% SWB is achievable, as well as identifying the optimal mix of the generation and the storage capacity. As this relationship is uh, non-linear, so it doesn't mean that the higher SWB capacity you install, the lower the cost of the system. And we can see from the graph over here, the x-axis represent 100% uh, SWB system cost. So the blue zone represent the cost of battery, and the, sorry, the green zone represent the cost of battery, and the blue zone represents the cost of solar and wind. And the, the, the x-axis represent the generating capacity. One times mean uh, it is enough to, just enough to supply the existing uh, demand, and seven times means seven times higher than the existing demand. So what's interesting about this graph is the system with seven times uh, generating capacity is not the cheapest in cost, but the system range from five, three times to five times uh, with average 
35 to 90 hours worth of battery has the lower system cost. The concept is simple. For the system with uh, one times generating capacity, which is just enough to supply for the existing grid, uh, you will definitely need to invest a lot to have this uh, huge amount of storage for the days with no solar and wind due to the weather condition. Uh, on the other hand, for the system with seven times generating capacity, you will have a huge amount of uh, energy supply, but with limited storage. So some energy generated from solar and wind will be lost uh, when the storage is fully charged. There will be losses and wastage of energy and hence the cost goes up again. Total energy uh, cost of 100% will be lower than this uh, conventional energy, even if we exclude the social cost. The sooner we achieve a 100% RE system, the faster this saving will be realized. Massive de redesign of the global energy system will be needed, including increasing uh, energy efficiency, or we call it EE, on all levels. Increased EE is needed to uh, reduce the high demand of the capacity of this renewable energy or, and the battery. Uh, we also need the flexibility in many forms, such as the energy supply side, we have wind and solar, but this should be interchangeable whenever it's needed. Uh, and then we, from the, for the transmission and distribution side, we should have a sector coupling and also the large and small scale grid integration. For the energy demand side, we should have storage and also uh, the demand response management. SWB will not, uh, the solar, wind and battery, will not merely re replace this conventional power generation technology as a proportional one-to-one uh, -one substitution but will instead create a much larger electricity system based on the entirely new uh, architecture that operates accordingly, uh, according to uh, different rules and metrics, uh, just like our internet. It disrupted many incumbents' uh, industry, but facilitated the emergence of, emergence of many more. Such a rapid trans transformation is necessary to stop the 7 million uh, human deaths uh, that occur annually today and also you should uh, we should use this to lower down the debt reduce the damage due to global warming and thus avoid the climate uh, catastrophe okay the superpower the two graph over here shows the hourly solar and wind generation data in california uh, this tells us that there is sufficient energy generated from wind and solar and the battery can be charged to 100 percent most of the time in california this is also noticed that uh, there are some days in the year when battery has been discharged to less than 25%. And that's why we need energy efficiency and smart control to be adopted. So with energy efficiency, you don't need a large storage system to store the energy when you don't have enough or supply of the, uh, for one or two days. And the smart control will be used to shift all the unnecessary load for the days uh, when we have uh, to the days when we have a uh, bright sky and strong wind again, and we are able to charge our battery to 100% again. So we have also uh, a link for uh, the Malaysia generation data. You can refer here later. Uh, if we don't have this EE and spark control, we will definitely need a bigger capacity of storage system to so store the energy for the day like this. So, okay. So just now we have uh, discussed about how to achieve the lower system cost with the combination of SWB. Now we discuss how to get more energy with the lowest possible cost. Any 100% SWB system will produce a surplus electricity at near energy, uh, near zero marginal cost uh, that we call the clean energy superpower. For example, what if we uh, increase the investment 20% more? in this uh, clean energy yucca graph. You will notice that we were able to get another 200 to 300 superpower with slightly more investment, or you can save it almost for free. With three times to five times uh, of the generating capacity, we were able to cover the existing demand over here. And with another 20% more investment, we will be able to cover uh, more such as the transportation sector, residential, commercial, and a bit of industrial sector. 
This allows the emergence of new business model across a wide range of industry. Uh, for example, we can have a uh, cryptocurrency mining, uh, metal smelting and refining, waste processing and recycling, water treatment and desalination, manufacturing of solar, wind and battery, and also the electrification of our road transportation. Okay, the Malaysian generation plan. This is, I think, a more similar to what uh, Mr. Zain has presented just now. Uh, so Malaysian government has revised the national renewable energy capacity mix target from 20% to 31% by 2025. So the government has also included a large hydro resources as part of our uh, IE definition for Malaysia. In achieving the 31% uh, of RE capacity mix, uh, a total of 1,178 megawatts is needed uh, to be developed from this year onward. So from this 1,178 megawatts, uh, out of this, 93.2% uh, is belongs to solar. And the remaining 80 kilowatts belongs to non-solar with constitute of about 6.8%. So these are the more detailed plan of our capacity mix uh, from 2021 to 2039. And you will realize that the energy generated from uh, fossil fuels still constitute of high percentage of uh, capacity mix. And we are saying that it is possible to achieve global 100% renewable energy supply uh, by 2030. So the question is, should we continue investing in fossil fuel-based energy? The cost of SWB costs, will, uh, the system will fall another 70% by 2030, making this clean disruption inevitable. Future investment in fossil fuel-based energy will be less economically viable than clean energy alternatives such as our uh, solar and wind. What about energy efficiency, since we have been talking about so much about renewable energy? So to achieve a 100% transition to renewable energy, we need both, uh, uh, both ed energy efficiency and also the renewable energy. So in this case, we need to maximize the investment efficiency and minimize the greenhouse gases intensity. For energy efficiency part, we need to increase the electrification of transportation, heating, and also industry. And also we should have smart appliances and digitalization. For renewables, we need a more flexible grids and uh, distributed renewables and prosumers. Renewable energy for heating and cooling and transportation. And also we need the role of DSM. DSM means demand side management. So the graph over here shows the 100% fossil fuel free energy transition for a few selected country in Asia, such as China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. And we can see that energy efficiency accounts for more than 50% of the transition away for uh, fossil fuel. The remaining energy, the remaining energy demand will be uh, covered mostly by solar and wind. Um, data here shows that our energy supplies are mostly from rooftop solar or solar farm, followed by wind power. It is surprised that uh, the beam power has a role to play even in tropical countries uh, such as Malaysia and also uh, Singapore. So it could be due to the wind news nowadays getting higher and higher. It is almost the height of an uh, effort tower as shown in the diagram here. The height of, uh, like for example, when we have uh, a, a wind mill over 200 meters, we will be able to achieve to 6.5 meters per second, which is uh, we are able to rotate the wind mill and start generating electricity. So for this uh, fossil fuel, when applying the true cost of fossil fuel, the payback period for this uh, uh, green alternative will be typically one to two years only. And the true cost of fossil fuel, such as health costs from air pollution, damage from climate change, traffic congestion and accidents, and also the subsidy shall be included in this study. And true cost of fossil fuel are uh, cost about 5.3 trillion US dollar per year, and it is equivalent to 6.5% of the global GDP. Uh, this, next, we go to the energy efficiency strategy investment and payback period. The chart over here shows the global investment of uh, in energy efficiency in 2018. 
And we can see that the EE investment in building sector constitute the highest percentage, which is about 58%, and followed by transportation and uh, industry. Among the EE investment in building, we can, uh, okay, sorry, the right hand side, the graph on the right hand side here shows the energy saving and the payback period. So the primary y axis is the energy saving, and the secondary y axis is the payback period, which you see the triangle over here. So among the EE investment uh, in building sector, we can see that the building envelope has the highest percentage, which is about 30%. So let's, let us look about the energy saving and the payback period. There are two items over here. First is the building weatherization and also the glazing retrofit. Building weatherization has the highest energy saving among all. And you will also notice that the glazing retrofit has the longest payback period. Why is it like that? This is because like uh, building weatherization uh, is related cheaper for EE investment because we, are like, we can change the orientation to prevent the main facade facing east and west, use light color of pink with a high solar reflected index, uh, add insulation to prevent heat gain, and also the minimize the windows to wall ratio. These are all mostly like the uh, passive architecture design. And if we remain all the proposal that I mentioned just now and merely just focus on the uh, glazing retrofit, we will likely need to change to a high performance glazing such as uh, low E glasses or even EGU or, or we call it the double glaze unit, which are relatively expensive than the other strategy. For EE investment uh, in the, the second highest is the hash rate and control. We have three category in the uh, right hand side. So we have BMS control strategy, chiller control review, and also the hash rate control. BMS control has the second highest energy saving and the payback period for all these three strategies is typically less than five years. Next, we go to this uh, DSM that we mentioned just now, the demand side management. So we have uh, six strategies techniques over here. First is the uh, value feeding. It basically means that uh, we increase the demand of the electricity during the off-peak period. And then we have uh, strategy conservation and strategy load growth. Uh, also, we have this peak, peak clipping, which is to lower down the demand during the peak hour, and also the load shifting, which shift the load during the peak demand to the off-peak period. And also, we have this uh, flexible load shape. In order to implement this uh, demand site management, a building load profile needs to be known. Hence, submitter should be installed for all the sectoral energy uh, end use and it can be divided into uh, space cooling, heating, lighting, our NHU, air handling unit, equipment, heat rejection, cooking, elevator and escalator, solar PV system, and also pump and other system that you would like to monitor the usage. Maximum demand is the highest level of uh, yeah, electrical demand monitor for a particular period, uh, usually it's for one period. TNB need to cater this peak load whenever uh, it is required by the customer. So the customer are encouraged to control their uh, electricity demand uh, during the daytime, which is the peak hour. So with BMS, we will be able to implement this, uh, we call it MDL program or the maximum demand limiting program. So following are the skill strategy that we can implement. We can turn off the light or dim the light. Same for chiller, we can ram it down or turn it off, increase temperature set point, and also no fire pump testing or electrical vehicle charging, or we call it EV, uh, during the peak hour. Next is the DSM strategy. So this is a model uh, overall demand profile for Bangkok uh, in 2030. Uh, in 10 years later, this is the estimated load if cooling system is still inefficient. We can see in the black line. And if efficient cooling is used, we can lower down it to here. With contribution, with another contribution from the 5 gigawatt distributed PV, or we got it TBV, we can further lower down the daytime load to here. So from here, you might wonder, the load profile is not really flattened and the nighttime load is still quite high from the initial load of 39 gigawatt to uh, about 
37 uh, gigawatt. So we would like to propose another thing, which is uh, we have these three strategies, which is the demand side management. Uh, storage charging means the referring to the TES, the thermal energy storage, and also uh, storage discharging. So we can implement DSM like load shifting to shift some load uh, from peak hour to off peak period and increase the profile load profile like this. And then when the sun is out, the demand is quite low due to the contribution of solar PV. So we can actually charge our thermal energy storage or TS tank at this time. And we can increase a bit of the low peak, oh, low load over here. Okay, and we discharge uh, after charging the, our TES, and then we can discharge it during the night time when people use uh, aircon the most throughout the day. So you can see the load profile curve is more flattened right now, and the maximum demand is uh, less than uh, 34 gigawatt. The time load of the A efficient is about 39 gigawatt. With TES, we can also reduce 5 gigawatt even during night time without contribution from. PV. So this is a, a case study from us. Uh, this is a load profile that we analyzed for one of our projects. Uh, it is a shopping mall in Malaysia. The load profile is quite similar to what we have seen in previous slides just now. The uh, x-axis represent the time and y-axis uh, represent the load, including the uh, solar PV. So as uh, the Left hand side, the graph on the left hand side over here is the graph, uh, is the data we collected before fine tuning. And the right hand side over here is the graph we collected uh, after fine tuning. So you notice that they, uh, we actually realized that there was uh, an unusual spike at 2 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. So uh, it reached until 2,100 kilowatt. After checking, it was actually because of all the SE was turned on together during the stock checking or stock replenish. So this was uh, quite unusual to some of the more. And then during daytime, we have this solar PV and we lower down the load. And during night time or evening time, we, the load increases again because uh, there are more people going into the mall and it reached until uh, 1,900. So after five to nine, what is the result? So we can see here, there's no more this uh, unusual spike during the midnight, but there was one day uh, there, the, it reached until 1,100, which is uh, still half of the initial uh, load. And for the daytime, it's the same. We still have contribution from solar PV. And uh, during the evening time, the night time, the load has also been reduced to uh, 1,650 kilowatt. So following are some strategy that we implemented in this mall. First thing is we have about 1.3 megawatt solar PV in this mall. Uh, we schedule the fire pump testing during the low maximum demand period. Uh, stagger the AHU starting time. Monitor the space temperature to avoid uh, unnecessary overcooling. Uh, maintain the chiller plant at 0 0.7 kilowatt per atom through the following measure. Uh, so we reduce the chill water pump and also the condenser water pump and the cooling tower minimum running frequency. We repitch the uh, cooling tower fan blades and also we reduce the minimum outdoor air supply from 30% to 25% while still complying to ASHRAE standard. Next, we moving on to the system level change for energy storage. Hydrogen is one of the exciting uh, energy storage system. Uh, or technologies which can be produced from excess renewable uh, electricity production. The hydrogen is produced from the electrolysis of water, which is the decomposition of water into uh, oxygen and uh, hydrogen gas by applying an electric current. The energy can be released again using the gas as fuel in the fuel cell and uh, an engine. So as we can see here, the wind and other renewable energy we can store for a sh short term storage over here, which is our as our battery. But also we can uh, go through the electrolyzer and have this hydrogen storage. 
So it is a simple process that can be carried out uh, with relatively high efficient uh, provided cheap power is available. Hydrogen energy storage is uh, of interest because the gas form of the basis of hydrogen economy uh, it replaced fossil fuel in many combustion applications. Another energy, possible energy storage in the future would be this uh, PHES, we call it a uh, pump hydro energy storage. So how does it work? So we have this uh, we simple concept of using excess energy from the renewable energy to pump water up the hill and hold it until it's needed. So we can see here first, renewable energy such as uh, wind and solar used to pump the water uphill during time of low demand. And then when the demand increases, uh, wind and solar production drop, water runs downhill from the upper reservoir, and then water runs through the turbine and create the electricity. This is more stable uh, and adding the electricity from the turbine uh, to the original renewable power. And from the study, uh, there is a, a, the potential that uh, the, the global potential for this uh, storage is 100 times uh, higher than the, what, what we needed today. It is a closed system. Uh, so the water is stored in one of the two reservoirs. And uh, so the water can be replenished, replenished uh, from the rainfall. So additional water is very required. The water requirement of a renewable uh, electric system are far less than a coal or nuclear-based system because cooling towers are not needed for renewables. Uh, another system level change, uh, we have been discussing uh, about the, uh, I'll just touch on a bit on the smart grid. From here, you will have a bigger picture on what I have mentioned in the first slide. So uh, this is our existing grid. We have a single directional grid system and we are having more and more renewable energy fit into this grid system. Decentralized renewable energy are used for self consumption and we have also increasing number of uh, electrical vehicles. Uh, and we are using the conventional metering for uh, our existing grid. So what we need in the future is, we need this type. We need bi-directional grid system, and, and also we need a virtual power plant that works remotely to combine a few independent energy resources into the network that can provide reliable energy 24 hours per day. So we also need a smart home or building integrated with uh, IoT. So we can, uh, there's a communication between demand and the supply side. EV, the electrical vehicle can also serve as a, the energy storage. And of course we need the smart metering for the communication I mentioned just now. Since uh, we have been discussing uh, about EE in commercial and residential, uh, sorry, in industrial. So I would like to touch on a bit on the residential as well. This is a projection of uh, energy consumption to 2040. The energy consumption is increasingly gradually and the reasons are because of uh, rising GDP per capita, rising global uh, flow of area and urbanization, rising demand for services, uh, high temperature humidity, air pollution, vulnerable to climate risk, and also the informal construction. So these are some uh, digital technology that we can uh, implement in uh, our home or our office. So we have this smart uh, thermometer, heating and cooling can be controlled remotely and the temperature can be adjusted according to uh, our preference. So it's just like our inverter aircon, it will continuously regulate the temperature by controlling the speed of our compressor motor. Uh, of course, we have this smart zoning, individual should be zoned, uh, smart window control and smart lighting with the occupancy control uh, or we also can integrate it with the uh, motion sensor or photo sensor. Uh, we have this smart plug, uh, so home energy management system which is the uh, EMS and the next one will be the advanced level of EMS with the automation feature, uh, we call it uh, BAS, uh, the building automation system. And for uh, our country Malaysia, we need this uh, smart district cooling instead of heating. So from all these uh, uh, digital technology, we have implemented a few in our office, such as 
we have this photo sensor uh, outside of our window to monitor the lux level. So when it reaches certain level, uh, lux level, it will send a signal to our blinds and the blinds will automatically turn down. And we have this also, uh, we have, we also have this smart plug, which, uh, co which is connected to our laptop and our ancillary devices, such as our printer and monitor. When it is uh, unconnected from our laptop, all this uh, ancillary equipment will be disconnected as well. Okay, uh, so distributed energy resources. So we need uh, these three items uh, to have a more sustainable supply of uh, energy. Uh, so we have this digitalization, electrification and decentralization. We need digitalization, which we can control all the building uh, equipment remotely. So uh, such like a smart building or smart home. Then we need a smart grid to communicate with the building in order to provide a flexible load. And lastly, we need renewable, decentralized renewable energy and the battery storage system to provide a clean energy supply with the lower system cost. So lastly, uh, I would like to show that the head for Malaysia uh, energy consumption. So this is the historical energy consumption data in Malaysia. The energy consumption has been increasing uh, and we have reached about 4,000 pectajoule uh, per year. So uh, for your information, 97% of our energy supplies comes from a uh, fossil fuel. So in order to reduce the demand for fossil fuel, we need to move away from it and move towards to energy efficiency and renewable energy. To phase out fossil fuel completely by uh, 2050, uh, we need a graph like this. And it just looks like our Asian head. As for the demand for uh, renewable energy, the graph will be probably look like this. And we need to move from uh, increase from 3% to 100% by 2050 to have a uh, carbon neutral to in order to achieve carbon neutral. Uh, energy supply will be fluctuating. So the demand side and the supply side should work uh, more hand in hand uh, with key strategy like, uh, like the man I mentioned just now, demand side uh, management, uh, maximum demand limiting, smart grid, digitalization of building, and also the optimization of the energy storage in order to provide a more reliable and more stable supply in the future. So that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, so I'm here to open some questions from the ground. All right, great. Thanks so much, Austin, for a lot of interesting stuff. I was puzzled by this one graph you showed where yep. you identified the transitions uh, projections for uh, 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 moving away from fossil fuel. And all ASEAN countries had like 50% share of EE and Malaysia only had like 10% share of EE. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, I, I was wondering why so little uh, EE contribution for the Malaysia side. It was a bit further back couple of slides further back. Um, and, you know, all other countries, Thailand, Philippines, uh, looks like they have more than 50%. Uh, um, yeah, I think, Danea, uh, this, this one, one on the left side, yeah. You see there, Malaysia uh, energy efficiency, the blank area is less than 10%, and all other countries have more than 50%. How? Yep. So uh, for this one, I think that we have, uh, like, I think it's probably because uh, the solution project, this graph is actually come from solution project and we uh, just get the data from there. So what we understand that is because we have uh, the sun most of the time, like the solar plants and solar roof. So most of the electricity can be generated from there. And to have a hundred percent of, uh, to come from this uh, solar energy, we will probably need about 0.74% of the land to have to go for a uh, hundred percent IE. So the other, like maybe nighttime or uh, to reduce the energy storage, we will need this uh, wind power. So in this case, that's why it analyzed that our energy efficiency is slightly lower than the renewable energy. Hmm. Yeah, maybe you can share the link to that study so people mm -hmm. can study it a bit more in detail. And if you go to the next slide, uh, mm -hmm. I have another question on the next slide here. Um, 
that's very interesting as well. It, it would be nice to get the link of that study as well, the energy saving and yeah. payback period for EE investment, because this is always crucial. What's the return on investment? Obviously, mm-hmm. the uh, replacement of the uh, um, glass looks not very attractive with 30 years <laughs> payback. But I guess that some other solutions like retrofitting with some shading solutions Mm -hmm. should have a much faster uh, payback. And I didn't see the uh, electrical motors in there, which is usually quite a high power consumption, but often doesn't appear as one of the items. Any comments on that, the potential for motors and for other types of solar uh, glass retrofit? Window um, retrofits. Okay, so maybe I'll uh, answer the question for the glazing because the motto I think is uh, probably included in one of the like the hatchback control or something. So mm. uh, for the glazing retrofit, it could be uh, we, we, we are not sure about the study, how they conducted this study, mm. but it could be because of the building is painted in black and uh, without any insulation for the wall. So mostly, I mean, if you want to just improve on the glazing retrofit, so we will probably need to increase the very high specification of the glazing, like very low value, low U value and very low SE value, which is the co- shading coefficient. So if you have uh, other passive architecture design, like such as you paint the wall in, in white to white color, and also you have insulation for your uh, facade. So you will def- probably need uh, maybe a laminated tempered glass to uh, to have this, to reduce this uh, cooling load. Mm. That's why the payback period over here is uh, quite high, like about 30 years. Any comments on the motors? Mm. For motors, uh, uh, sorry, I don't really have any comment on it. It could be really uh, included in one of these uh, strategy over here. Mm. Uh, I can share the link later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could send the links for those two studies, that I think would be very interesting. We have a couple of other uh, comments in here. Uh, the ASIS is asking, how can we overcome the high cost for hydrogen-related technologies? And Dayang is asking... Can you give any projects done on this for existing building infra, like more detailed case studies? I guess. Uh, uh, um... Sorry, the uh, case study for hydrogen storage. No, one is uh, how can we overcome the high cost for hydrogen-related technologies? That's one question. Maybe we yep. do that first. Okay, so uh, for this, uh, I think it's probably. Let me search the slide. Okay, so this is the slide. Okay, so the cost is, I think, uh, mostly people are most concerned about the uh, the energy storage. How can we store it and then how can we uh, use it? So uh, we can actually, I think, store it in uh, three different ways, uh, if I remember correctly. So it can be uh, in gas form or the liquid form. So uh, if you want to store, it can be stored as a, I mean, as a liquid or also it can be an absorbent inside the solid state. So if we want to have, uh, I think this is probably due to uh, demand and supply thing. So if you have more demand and supply, then the cost will probably go down. So for now, uh, I can't comment on like how to reduce the cost like uh, really because we don't really have a, a actual start case I mean, it project implemented in Malaysia, except for the uh, like the fuel cell thing or the fuel cell vehicles that are starting in Malaysia, like in Sarawak or something. Yeah. Um, I suggest maybe the question from Dayang and the comment from Chris could be further clarified. I think uh, can the Dayang question is, can you give any projects done for this, for existing building infra? Um, I think that is asking for case studies, but maybe it can be clarified a little bit more. And uh, Chris is, um, yeah, Chris was related to the uh, retrofitting of glazing, right? Uh, Whereas uh, um, building have to forego rental payback. (laughs) Can't afford, huh? Yeah, I mean, these are the things that you should do when you do the building in the first place. But I think some of the uh, retrofits in terms of uh, solutions for windows 
that at the same time provide glare uh, reduction and stuff like that, and potentially uh, lower temperature inside and other potential uh, wellness benefits, especially the glare, then you can calculate it in a different way. I mean, the calculation from a study, you need to look at the detail, how have they calculated the ROI? Okay, we have comments from Gregors about the um, hydrogen, that it will most likely be viable in 10 years. And um, Muhammad is uh, commenting here, he's intrigued by the presentation, the battery in renewable energy project. Last time I checked, whenever we involve battery in the renewable energy project, the cost will spike up quite big. How do you see the future in this in Malaysia? Okay, uh, let me go back to the slide just now. Okay, so. Okay, hi, uh, Mohammad Sidaus, to your question. Uh, I'm not sure what kind uh, the study, I mean, the proportion of your solar and battery costs uh, in your study previously. So from here that the study from uh, the, the group, this uh, global 100% RE group, so they actually mentioned that uh, this graph is actually comprises of the balance, I mean, the trade-off relationship between the battery and also the solar and wind. So uh, with this, maybe uh, uh, you can share more on your study because for if you ask me about the future, the, uh, how do you see the future in this in Malaysia? So uh, I think for this case, uh, we have kept this graph from California. So we can see that the, the solar actually drops a bit during the winter time over here. But for Malaysia, we have overhead sun most of the time, like all along the year. So we will say that the, uh, the generation from solar will be relatively stable and we could have saved more, uh, I mean, save more money and reduce the cost of the system compared to California. Maybe if I can add to that as well, I guess, you know, what you're proposing here uh, is to use minimum amount of batteries rather than cover everything with batteries. Uh, and the batteries get supported with demand side management. You're going to incentivize people to run their uh, washing machine in the middle of the night when there is no peak demand rather than running it between seven uh, to 10 when you had the highest peak as in the example of Bangkok, right? So you're not loading up with huge amounts of batteries, which would make everything very expensive. You are using a couple of uh, tools and methodologies to overall balance the demand. And that way it doesn't get that expensive, correct? Yeah, yeah. You, you need to find a, a balance point between these two. You cannot just rely on one side, like you have uh, like many uh, of the generating capacity, but with limited storage, but you wouldn't be able to cover the day back, uh, during the year end like rainy season. But if you have a lot of uh, storage, then you have limited uh, of the generating capacity, then you will take a very long time to charge your battery to 100%. Okay, we have the comment from Gregors. The hidden cost is 88 billion per year in terms of adverse health costs. That's huge. Then we have uh, as well here a question. What's the estimated cost for one kilowatt solar? Um, and, and Gregors comments, the figures come from the IMF, International Monetary Fund. Um, so any, any comment, Austin, on the uh, um, the one kilowatt solar power generation, what would you have to invest for that in average? Uh, in average, I think now today, the, sol the cost of solar has been dropping. So the estimation cost of one kilowatt peak is range from like just for commercial industry, not, not to the solar farm. I mean, for commercial industry, it's range from uh, maybe 3,000 to 5,000. Okay. A kilowatt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good. And maybe the final question here from uh, Muhammad before we go into our short break: uh, How much battery we need as to capacitate that, and how much the cost involved? Just idea figure is sufficient. Obviously, that depends on the size of the project. But uh, yeah. 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 So we yeah. If let's say we have this uh 
4,000 pectajo SPC in the last slide just now, energy consumption per year, then we need to cater, uh, able to cater this amount of uh, demand and also then only we can determine what is the trade-off relationship between this uh, battery and this, uh, generating capacity from renewable energy. All right, great. And both Chris and Gregors agree that the hidden costs that we often don't look at are key for us to look at the big picture. And once we take that into consideration, uh, then renewables are already quickly the cheapest choice available. Okay, one final uh, question here. What is the lifespan of battery in solar power generation, Austin? You, you are muted already. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not really sure on this, like the lifespan of a battery. It depends on what battery you buy, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the cheap lead acid battery won't last as, as long as a, a more sophisticated, more eco-friendly lithium ferrous battery so uh, th there's a wide variation, but I guess what you normally have to uh, roughly calculate is five to 10 years. I don't know, maybe Elon Musk Tesla battery lasts longer. I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but there might be, is there any battery guru here that can answer that? Maybe you can answer privately as well to GSE Elva, not sure exactly about the exact name, but maybe you can answer privately. Great, loads of information. Excellent. Yes, thanks, Austin, for the uh, informative thanks, presentation, yes. as Chris nicely says. Uh, that was great. Uh, we had two excellent presentations. We have more to come. Yes, uh, this is uh, Selva, G. Selva, uh, who commented there. So if any battery guru here, please uh, uh, um, answer the question of uh, Selva. So uh, that would be great. Yes, excellent presentation. Loads of comments coming in. Uh, we have uh, Mustafa Kamal, uh, another one of our frequent gurus at the Comfori events coming up after the break. And uh, we will definitely get a lot of good insights from him, uh, mainly on the uh, uh, ventilation HVAC issue which is as well related to the whole COVID risk discussion. So I'm learning loads. Thanks a lot. And see you again in 15 minutes, guys. All right. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Matthias.